Elon Musk visited Israel and he talked with Netanyahu. They had a conversation on Twitter, on X. He compared Hamas to Nazis. In your opinion, is that realistic? At the end of the day, this type of thinking would benefit Israel and Israelis. No, I do not think it will benefit Israel and the Israelis. Uh, I do not think that the most of the things that I have learned about coming out of Elon Musk uh, are not really worth uh, very much time. They have proven to me something that my father once said to me. It, in order to be rich, it is not necessary to be smart. And I think Elon Musk is walking proof that my father had a good point when he made that uh, remark. Uh, I once admired a British film. It was called Being There. And it featured uh, the actor um, whose name right now, Peter, forget his name right now, uh, a very famous British comedian who was the lead actor. And in the film, uh, Being There, a person with uh, mental limitations who is functioning as a gardener for a wealthy man uh, discovers one day that the wealthy man has died and he doesn't know quite what to do. He's the gardener and he listens to people who talk to him. He doesn't quite understand what they are talking about but he's a nice person and he gets along with them. Long story short, the movement, the movie shows how he ends up being uh, the president, becomes the president of the United States. Um, Peter Sellers is the actor's name. And the movie is brilliant because as the title suggests, where you end up in life depends above all on where you are, whether you are in the right place at the right time to get to a lofty position, or whether you may be not in the right place, and so you don't get the position. But as my colleague Stephen Resnick used to say, the position makes the person much more than the other way around. So, I think Mr. Netanyahu is a old politician on the way out, and Mr. Musk is an old business person, likewise, on the way out. Each of them has their achievements in their past, not in their future, and they are going out in ways that are, how shall I be polite, not very complimentary. Mr. Musk took over Twitter and has, if not already destroyed it, seems on the way to doing it. Mr. Netanyahu uh, inherits a government that was in great difficulty before, and that government having moved several steps to the right wing, which is also where the Nazi experience is located, He's not doing real well either. Uh, if you are familiar at all with internal Israeli politics, you will know that Mr. Netanyahu scores very badly on the polling inside Israel. The majority of the people of Israel would like to see him gone as their leader. Uh, and you put all that together, the conversation between Mr. Musk and Mr. Netanyahu, I don't think is very significant one way or the other. Politico wrote an article. They're assuming that Trump would win the election in 2024. They're talking about Europeans have to offer a Ukraine deal that Trump can refuse. How do you see the Europe today? Are they helping themselves? I think the Europeans are in a very, very difficult position. I think that most of the leaders live in a world that is occupied also by leaders here in the United States. We are saying in the United States, more and more of us, left wing, right wing, and in the middle, 
that we have never seen a government, in this case, Mr. Biden, but potentially Mr. Trump, we have never before seen a government that seems so utterly out of touch with a majority of the people. Even the people who will vote for Mr. Trump do so out of a mixture of anger and bitterness and resentment and conspiracy theories, many of which Mr. Trump is a symbol for, but is not connected to in any reasonable way. He's not part of them, and they're not part of him. And the people who are going to be voting for Mr. Biden are mostly people who are afraid of Mr. Trump, but are in no way, do not feel that Mr. Biden is a reliable member of whatever it is they think they are a part of. And I see that in Europe everywhere. I mean, even if you don't believe in polling, the feeling of the French people, and I have family in France, the feeling of the French people towards Emmanuel Macron is, to say the least, uh, he's a clown. He's a person they do not take seriously. They feel absolutely no loyalty to that I can perceive. And it's not all that different in many of the other countries of Europe. I mean, crystal clearly, the, the conservatives in England, you know, they're just waiting for the election they know they will lose to arrive. The Germans are confused about a coalition that barely holds itself together, that has nothing to do with the socialism of Olaf Scholz, has even less to do with whatever the word green means in politics, because the German Green Party is, is disconnected from almost anything one can think of other than hostility to Russia and excitement about Ukraine. And indeed, when one looks at Europe, one sees the minute you go below the surface, people who are very disconnected from their uh, European foreign policy. What is this all about? You know, they are holding on to their Atlantic alliance, but that's because these are mostly older politicians who have been allied with the United States and Britain for so long, they don't have any other place to go politically. But the young people and the people coming up and those who are not tied in to the old European alliance with the United States, they are very unhappy about where things are going. Let me turn to the economics, which, which makes it even sharper. The world is dividing into two major economic blocks. The decline of the American empire is happening together with the decline of the American bloc, or if you like, the G7, the United States, Germany, France, Britain, Italy, Canada, and Japan. That's the G7. The alternative bloc is the BRICS, the original BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and now the addition of the six new countries uh, that were brought in. Okay, if you look at the total GDP of the G7, it's about 29% of global production happens in the G7. In the BRICS, before adding the six new ones, it was 33%. That's a complete new world economically. It is just a new world. And notice, please, that the Europeans are not even in the story. There is no European bloc. What the Europeans have is a position for their four major economies, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, as a junior partner in the declining American bloc. That's a very poor position for Europe. Remember, the last empire was the British Empire. 
and it struggled to control the world. And who did it struggle against? Mostly the French and German and Belgian empires. All of that is gone. All of that has left Europe not knowing which way to go, being out of the other islands. The biggest question, if you're honest, in the core of the European economy, namely Germany, but similar questions are being asked among European industrialists, is which way should we go? Is our future with the BRICS or is our future with the G7? The mere fact that that is a question they have to ask themselves, and they do, because that is the great question for their immediate future tells you that they are in the position of deciding which way to go, because ne in neither case will they be dominant. They are not in that position. They've lost that position. They haven't been able to get Europe together. They haven't been able to shape a European position. Watching the collapse of Europe into a chorus on Ukraine, with the exception of you know, Hungary and one or two others, is watching the Europeans unable to make their own politics. Even the Ukrainians would be better off if Europe had its own strategy, had its own point of view that the Ukrainians could then try to play the Americans off of the Europeans, both of them against the Russians and the Chinese, but the, Euro the Ukrainians lack a Europe to deal with. All they do is ask the Europeans to provide what the Americans no longer will do, which the Europeans are doing again, at least some of them. Although the political wind, and not just in Italy, we saw that a week ago in the Netherlands. The Ukrainians are losing friends in Europe, and Europe has many, many reasons to cut its dependence on the United States and on the, Euro the Ukrainians. These are real problems that no amount of political pretense is going to make go away. You talk about BRICS. One of the new members of BRICS is Argentina. We know that recently, as you predicted in the other session, you said that he's this right-wing candidate going to win. Would this guy be a solution for the difficulties that Argentina is experiencing right now? And what are the roots of these difficulties that Argentina has right now? There is a saying in the United States, and I'm sure in other parts of the world, and it goes like this, even a broken clock is right, right on time, twice every day, right? Look, Argentina has been a seriously problematized economy for a long time. It has made the decisions to use borrowed money particularly money borrowed from outside Argentina to try to solve its problems. And it has found the result to be very, very dangerous repeatedly. Okay. It has also been very hostile to political innovation from the left, it has a long history of brutal repression of the left. Uh, if you know the politics, and one of the things Mr. Malay did was try to act out being friendly to Israel and the Jewish people because of the horrible history of what was done to Jewish uh, residents of Argentina uh, in past years. And I'm not talking about the distant past. I'm talking about the near past. So Argentina entered this current economic situation, this political situation, 
with an inflation rate running over 100%, that is prices doubling on an annual basis, with loans it, it cannot repay in foreign currencies, et cetera, et cetera. It was a situation that proved, proved to the Argentinian people what they have already understood, but it proved it again. The normal, usual kind of center-left, center-right politics is unacceptable. It has failed. It has failed them repeatedly. It doesn't offer solutions. And the political forces further to the left are still frightening for them and are repressed, partly politically, partly by the military. Okay. What do you then do with a population that understands that politics as usual is a dead end, is a failure? That what you can say is that the problems of modern capitalism have outrun the capacity of the normal politics generalized or generated by that capitalism to solve. And we see that everywhere. That's why Macron is ridiculed in France. That's why there's so much disaffection with the political leaders around the world. Look at them. Look at them. Look at the person who was the opponent of Mr. Malay in Argentina. This is Casper Milk Toast. There's nothing there to vote for. Who gets the attention is the person who says the most effectively, I am not like all the others. I am different from all the others. I am. I will call them names. I will insult them. The best example I can think of is in my own country, Mr. Trump. He is a crude uh, person. He doesn't pay his bills. He abusively treats and speaks about women. It, it, it's disgusting. He's a disgusting human being, as well as a, a, a newcomer to politics who clearly does not know anything about these issues. But that makes him unique. That makes him different. He can get up and talk. And the very fact that he doesn't talk in the usual speak language, he doesn't, he becomes attractive to people. Not because people agree with his policies. First of all, they don't know what those policies are. Number two, he doesn't have clearly defined policies. And number three, the policies he does have are crazy. They are there simply to pr pr produce the feeling in people he's different. So in the United States, we have 75 years of Cold War, and suddenly Mr. Trump speaks nicely about Mr. Putin. What's that about? That makes you very different. Oh, you're different right? It, it, it's bizarre. Now, what does Mr. Malay do in Argentina? He follows the Trump playbook. Mr. Orban does that in Hungary. The woman in Italy, she does that for the Italians. But let's go back to Mr. Malay in, in Argentina. He proposes to do away with the central bank of the country. What sense does this make? He proposes to get rid of the Argentinian currency and to replace it with the U.S. dollar. That raises more problems and difficulties and dangers for uh, Argentina than anything else. But it is very attention grabbing. The two most important countries trading with Argentina today are Brazil and China. He has announced his intention to cut off the dependency of it. What are you talking about? Wait, wait, you can't do that, or let's put it differently. If you do it, you will bring a catastrophe to your country. And that catastrophe will wipe you out. But you know something? 
to win the election. It was all a wonderful piece of theater. And in order to make the point, the man, Mr. Millay, I don't know if you saw it, but if you looked at photographs, he had his hair wildly around his head. He wore clown outfits. He did everything that his advisors could think of to show the people here is something different. And that's what the people wanted. Here in the United States, apropos your comment on political uh, magazine article, if Mr. Trump wins next year, which is possible, and Mr. Biden is the candidate whom he defeats, which is possible, it will be because Mr. Biden represents the same old center-left Democratic Party, just like Mr. Bush represented the same old center-right. Mr. Trump destroyed the Bush family politically, and so now he's going to do the same thing to Mr. Biden. And the fact that Biden can show that Mr. Trump has violated the law a hundred times and is in trouble and is being tried in the court system of the United States won't make much difference because it doesn't change the fact that he's different. Look at that. The guy's running from jail. He may have to run for office from inside the prison. And that, too, will make him unique and different. You are watching the disintegration of the old political world. If there's anything I can get across, it would be that. Don't get caught in the details. Try to take a step back and ask the question, what is going on here? And the answer is, the world is changing. Four centuries ago, in the, the 16th century, we left the, the feudal Europe behind and a new economic system came into being, capitalism. Instead of lords and serfs, we had a new system with employers and employees. That was not feudalism. There was no wage in feudalism. There was no labor market in feudalism. All of these things come with capitalism. There were markets, uh, for sure. Markets go back to Aristotle and Plato because you can read their de debates about markets. By the way, both of them were critical of markets, which people today cannot imagine because it's the, the great thinkers of ancient Greece. But the capitalist world began, had its dynamic center, first in England, then in Western Europe, then in the North America, Japan, and finally the whole world. It has taken four centuries to become the dominant system. But it's only in the last 50 years, the last half century, that the center the dynamic, powerful center of capitalism is disappearing. The British Empire was the peak. It has been downhill with the British decline, temporarily postponed by the American replacement for the British. But now the American is going down and it has become unmistakable where the dynamic growth center of capitalism has gone. It's not in England, which is a joke as an economic unit. That's why a, a caricature clown like Boris Johnson could become the leader. Think about it. A crude liar who loses his job because he gets caught lying like Trump. Again, the same story. It's over for Britain, and everybody knows it. Even the British now understand it.
Brexit was a joke, a terrible joke for the British who brought this on themselves. The center of capitalism is gone from England. It's gone from Europe. It went for a while to the United States, but it's now left the United States too. And we all know where it went. China, India, Brazil, that, that's where it's gone. That's where the growth is still remarkable. So now we have capitalism, global capitalism split. The old in the West and the new in the East. Old capitalism has new problems. New capitalism will have its own problems, which we know about because we saw them in the United States and Britain before. Two different capitalisms, each struggling with their own problems as they compete with one another. That's the new world. And in that world, the old po politics is redundant, is irrelevant, is powerless becomes literally clownish. And that's what we're watching. We're seeing the, the extreme forms of that in Malay, in Argentina, in Trump, in Orban, in um, the anti-immigrant uh, fellow in the Netherlands who won the other day and so on. So we're watching where this bursts but don't be de detailed by that particularity. What's important is to see the larger picture of what is unfolding in front of us. And here's perhaps the most important point. Capitalism is splitting, global capitalism. That's already a fact we're all dealing with. Every little country in the world contemplating a, a new harbor they not need to build, or investment in their school system, or a health service, now knows it has two power blocks to go to for a loan, or a grant, or a trade deal, or a opportunity for their students to get higher education, or whatever. They can go west, which is declining, or they can go east, which is growing rapidly, and you can imagine where they're going to go. Wow. All of that is going on. All of that is the reality. But behind it comes the old critique. And that's the critique that says, all of you are organizing your economy with a small group of people at the top who are the employers. They can be private, they can be government officials, but they're the employers and they control a mass of people who are the employees. They do that in the United States, they do it in Poland, they do it in Nigeria, they do it in Beijing, that's what they're doing. And there's an alternative that has been there critiquing that system from the beginning. And it's called socialism. It's the idea that you can do better than having a system that produces goods and services with an employer and an employee. You can have the alternative that the employees become their own employer. They end the gap. It's no longer master-slave. It's no longer lord and serf. It's no longer employer-employee. It's finally the democratic idea we govern ourselves, not just in the community where we live, but in the community where we work. Democracy in both of them interdependent one with the other. That's not going away. That critique is becoming sharper in the old capitalism, and it is discovering new adherents in the new one, too. And that's 
going to be the fight of the 21st century. Xi Jinping believes that Marxism, Leninism, and Mao are two important elements that guided the Chinese people out of darkness of a long night and established a new China. Can you describe us what are these two elements? I, of course, I cannot <clears throat> tell you what's in the mind of Xi Jinping. I have nothing to do with him or he with me. And so I'm not sure exactly what he means. I do know that Marxism, uh, Leninism, and so on are important systems of ideas in the world that they have affected everybody one way or another, directly or indirectly. Um, and so, yes, of course, the Chinese uh, have every reason, especially since uh, after 1949, they officially embraced uh, Marxism, Leninism as a national uh, idea. Before that, it was the idea of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, the problem here is that what Marxism and Leninism mean have been differently interpreted in different parts of the world. And that has happened to every other great idea in the history of the world. It's never only understood in one way. You know, Christianity has Roman Catholics, it has Greek Orthodox, it has uh, Protestants, it has fill in the blank. You all know that. OK, um, the problem with Xi Jinping's argument, I would argue, is the following. One of the major interpre interpretations of Marxism Leninism has held that what is socialism is when the government takes a major position in deciding how to produce and distribute goods and services. Capitalism is then associated with a private operation of production and distribution, utilizing a market. Whereas in socialism, one interpretation went, the government steps in. You can have one kind of government, uh, socialism, where the government manages and regulates the private sector. That you had in the socialisms we associate with Scandinavia or with Western Europe. There you have socialists, often with political power. They control the state and they regulate a private capitalist economy. And that's called, you might call it socialism, uh, with the characteristics of Scandinavia or socialism with German characteristics, or Italian, or French, or Spanish. Then you have a second, different interpretation. And this interpretation says, no, if you want to overcome capitalism, it's not enough to regulate it. It's not enough to control it. You have to get rid of it. You have to replace the private owners of means of production with the public. The government, representing the public as a whole, should own and operate enterprises. Roughly speaking, this was done with industry in the Soviet Union. Now we get to the Chinese interpretation. And remember that Xi Jinping supports the definition of China, the self-identification of China as, quote, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Okay, what that means is, very concretely, that Xi Jinping and his associates interpret Marx and Lenin in a way that is a hybrid, midway between Scandinavian-type socialism and Soviet type socialism. It's a hybrid because in China today, roughly half of the economy is government owned and operated enterprises. And the other half is privately owned and operated with a powerful regulatory communist party and Chinese state 
managing all of this. Now that is unique. That is a definition of an operating socialism that is neither the Scandinavian Western European model nor the Soviet model. It is a combination, a hybrid. And now to be fair to the Chinese, they are able to say quite honestly that they have generated a better record of economic growth with their hybrid than either the Scandinavian or the Soviet model were able to achieve. And that is true. All the statistics we have, not just from China, but from the World Health Organization, from the United Nations, from the, you name it, confirm the broad outlines of what I've just said. So if Mr. Xi Jinping means that the hybrid they've created has a debt to Marx and Lenin and all the socialist experiments that have gone on before modern China, that makes perfect sense. I think that's true. I think it's good that he shows we got some of what we've done from those experiments. But like those experiments, the future will be yet another form or forms of socialism that will draw on Chinese experience, as well as Soviet and Scandinavian experience. Socialism is a work in progress. Socialism is the self-critique of capitalism. It is the next stage, and it will come one way or another, sooner or later, no doubt in forms we can't quite yet imagine, but that will be the struggle of the 21st century. And we will look back with irony and sarcasm at the naive people who, at the end of the 20th century, thought that the struggle between capitalism and socialism had finally been resolved. The Soviet Union and Eastern Europe collapsed. The United States had what some have called the unipolar moment, a period of time when it dominated the world alone. But the the people who are Marxists in the Hegelian sense, who understand that the one thing that never changes is the process of change itself, they would have understood, don't be naive. Socialism will surprise you. And boy, has it. It's come roaring back all over the world, one way or another, Old capitalism will be struggling with socialist criticism. After all, Bernie Sanders is a socialist, and he proved that a socialist can become the most popular politician in the United States, which current polling of people younger than 35 already shows us. And we're going to see socialists emerging in Brazil, they're already there. In China, they're already there. In India, they've always been there. They have their issues to raise, their proposals to make. And the difficulties, the contradictions inside capitalism, old and new, will generate their corresponding self-criticisms, and those will be the socialisms of the future. That seems very clear to me. And the fact that the people who run today's capitalism can't see or identify or understand socialism does not surprise me. Because what is clear to me is they cannot see or understand their own capitalist system either.
Richard, just to wrap up this session, I want to talk about Cornel West and Jill Stein, two important candidates in this 2024 election. How do you find each of them? Do you think that at the end of the day, are we going to be able to bring all these forces together to make a bigger movement? Well, first of all, I am grateful to both um, Jill Stein and to Cornel West uh, I know them both personally, um, and I am grateful to them for having taken the step to put themselves in this situation, uh, because they will be saying things that no other candidate, with the possible exception of Marianne Williamson, but no other candidate accepting her uh, will dare say. Um, and so I'm appreciative of all three uh, of them for, for doing what they are doing. I think it's a small step. I agree with you that until all of these forces are unified uh, and become a new serious left opposition in the United States, we will not see the kind of change that we need. I, I, I think that's widely understood. I would tell you though, that just as important as Jill Stein and Cornell and Marianne Williamson are, so too are what we might call actions on the ground. The fact that our service workers, and remember, the United States is no longer a manufacturing country. We are a service capitalism. The overwhelming majority of our people produce services, not goods. Goods production has been exported. That's what happens in China or India or Vietnam or Brazil and so on. They produce goods. We produce services. The fact that the leading service employers, Amazon, Starbucks, and many more like them, are now experiencing an upsurge in labor organizing, organizing unions, organizing strikes, organizing with the help of social movements in this country, women's movements, movements against uh, racism based on skin color, and so on. These are very important signs. Movement in the first place, movement alliances in the second place, social movements realizing how important labor movement is and vice versa. The idea that we can make a deal, we the social movements will help you in your labor organizing if you as labor unions will help us in the social movement we're trying to develop, yeah. This is where power lives and lies, and people in this country understand it. I do not believe, however, that this will happen quickly, and I do not believe it will happen without difficulty. And the reason for that should be clear to anyone. Old capitalism, which is what we have here, has had one, two, three centuries to produce a self-conscious, powerful top 10% of its people. The super rich, 1%, and their servants, the intellectuals that work for them, the top 5%, 10%. They control the media. They control the universities. They control the rest of society to keep their position within old capitalism secure. That is a formidable enemy. They have become lazy. They have become sure of themselves because their domination has been so total. But they are also making huge mistakes. They're making a judgment that they are sitting on top of the world the way they did, but they aren't. 
Let's be very honest for a moment. The last war that the United States won was World War II. The Korean War in the 50s, they lost. The French and Americans in Vietnam later in the 50s, they lost. The United States at the end of the 50s and into the 60s in Vietnam, the United States lost. In Afghanistan and Iraq, the United States lost. In the Ukraine now, the United States is losing. And the long-run prospects for what the Israelis with the United States are doing in Gaza does not look good for them either. This is not a record of success. It's a record of failure. And you're the big powerful at the top. When the war in Ukraine broke out, American leaders from President Biden on down said that the Russians would collapse, that the Russian ruble would collapse, that Russia would be brought to its knees economically. None of that happened. Nothing like that happened. Nothing like that looks to be happening now or any time in the future that I can see or that anyone I know can point to. These are not isolated failures and isolated mistakes. They are signs that the system is breaking down. That combination that the people at the top don't understand what's happening, do not look like they know what's going on, cannot control the situation, lose the wars. That together with the feeling from below that this system is no longer tolerable, that the inequality is unbearable, that the instability of the capitalist system, the cyclical recession that we expect in 2024 once again. The combination of people at the top who can't govern and people at the bottom who will not tolerate much more bad government, that's a revolutionary situation. We are heading in that direction. And the people at the top have no clue of what's going on. <clears throat> it reminds me of a famous book written by an American journalist named John Reed. And it had a famous title. It was called 10 Days That Shook the World. It was the journal kept by this journalist, John Reed, who was in Moscow and Leningrad during the Russian Revolution in 1917. And he described how the revolutionaries moving in the streets made way for the coaches of the rich on their way to the opera and then on their way to the fancy restaurant after the opera. And that these two were unaware of what history they were making. The revolutionaries knew what they were doing, but the people on the way back to and from the opera had no clue. For them, the czar, the Russian Orthodox Church, the crazy monk Rasputin, they were all permanent. They were forever. Little did they understand that they had barely a few days left. I sense the coming together of something like that right now.